All right, let's move on to earthwork. Um, this is division 31 in the master format. However, uh, remember earlier I said that there were book chapters and they align directly with the master format numbering, but in this case it doesn't because they didn't want to skip all these chapters. So uh, while it's division 31, this is actually chapter 20 in your textbook. And in particular, uh, in this section, this is part one of two, we're only going to be covering uh, section 2.3. So uh, what we're going to be talking about today is site preparation and clearing, getting ready for uh, construction to begin. This is getting taking the whole site, clearing it out and everything else. So what, let's start by defining what we mean by site construction and it's anything that, that, that is the pre-construction process. Um, so what does that mean? Well it means that you know we're, we're going from something that looks like this, this is our before uh, and this is our after, right? So how do we get from one to the other? Well, we got to clear out all the trees and everything. We are going to have to have some infrastructure for some roads and things like that. Um, and this bottom picture is kind of like a, you know, ready for construction phase, where the top is the beginning and final. This would be uh, the, right at that, that, that end of the site preparation where we have everything cleared out, we have access in here, um, we've probably graded it. You can see over here there's some soil that is being stored uh, and what else can we see? Uh, we see they put some temporary uh, fencing up and we can see that this is the, the building structure where it's going to be outlined. So when we talk about um, what is this site construction, we have that site clearing like I just showed, uh, that building location and orientation. We do have the relationship to finished grade, meaning this whole thing was probably graded in some way, um, dewatering, you know, getting the water out, uh, excavating or backfilling, whatever's needed to get the grade right. Really excavation and, back, and, and backfilling and grading are almost all the same. But So yeah, so that's somewhat what's included. Now, why do we care? Why is this such an important part of our building process? Uh, first and foremost, the aesthetics. Uh, so if you, you know, if, if you're going to bulldoze all your trees and leave no vegetation, that looks aesthetically much different than, than a building where you left a lot of uh, mature trees there. Also, the grading can affect that as well. So, uh, you know, how is it, it going to be oriented on the, the actual land? Is it going to you know, be tilted, not the building itself, but is the land going to be tilted with the building coming out? Um, what about uh, where the building is going to be as far as the sun? Uh, so which side is your southern facing side? How is that going to affect any utility bills or anything like that? So we talked before about sustainability considerations in construction, and that's a big one. You know, where is it going to be located? And a lot of this site uh, construction, this pre-construction, it will determine it. If you have trees to shade your building, then of course that will reduce your heating and uh, your heating bill in the summertime. Overall impact on construction costs, so some of that could do with how you are, uh, let's say you had a big open area for trucks to come in and, and dump things off, right? Versus if you had an area way on the other side of the lot, well, that could change your construction costs. Maybe you have more people sitting or not working, or maybe you are spending more time moving things back and forth. Uh, affect the final appearance of the building. Well, that goes along with the aesthetics, right? I don't know why I have that in there twice. Structural stability uh, is a big one. So this has to do with, you know, getting the, the soil and everything ready. Put your building on because if we have a building and and we are really concerned with what's going on for our grading um, and also our compaction or dewatering or whatever we're doing as far as um, our soil to make our our building uh, structurally sound and we'll talk more about that in just a slide or two. So uh, with that we have site clearing, clearing out the whole site, clearing and grubbing you'll hear that word sometimes. We can't put our building right on top of of some active vegetation like this like we couldn't just pour in some gravel and start immediately building because this vegetation will start to decompose and as it decomposes you'd have voids and if you have voids things start to settle and it's a nightmare so we need to get down to natural soil uh, meaning we have to clear off this topsoil and strip it down to to what we're seeing down at this lower slide right uh, ready to build on and this this is what I've shown in the other slide we do stockpile 
a lot of this soil uh, so we can use it later on in in uh, landscaping and also uh, like I said about the trees that can really affect the aesthetics and and even the uh, future utility bills right so that was site clearing uh, here's an example from a Poudre School District job at Centennial High School about what they had in their project manual as far as site clearing and you can see some of the exact same things we just said removing the trees and vegetation clearing and grubbing stripping the topsoil uh, removing above grade site improvements that means that there's an existing say shed there and you're going to put a building there of course you have to remove it that's part of this site clearing part right clearing out the site getting ready for construction uh, disconnecting, capping, sealing uh, all old utilities. So if you're going through a place where there's some existing utilities, you might need to cap them off. Um, that means they aren't going to be in use anymore. Uh, so you, you can uh, see what the real life example is. It goes on exactly with what we were just saying. Uh, let's move on to site characteristics. So what does the site actually look like or what does it need to look like? Uh, there's really four different factors we're going to look at for the, the characteristics of the site that we're going to be building on. The reason we care is because it will affect the building and um, it'll affect its, uh, you know, how we're going to support our building and um, how we're going to have to consider future implications due to temperature changes or or where it's located or what kind of environmental factors we might have to, to consider. So I'm going to look at each four of these individually. The first one being the soil type and properties. Uh, soils is a cool topic. Um, the CM majors will have a whole class in, in soils. And there's even a soils lab, which is probably the more fun labs because you, you do actually do a lot of odd experiments with soil, such as just rubbing it between your hands or uh, pounding it and seeing how much water comes out, baking it, you know. It's, I like soils. Uh, but why do we care? So when we when we put a building on a site it's going to either be supported by the soil directly or you're going to drill all the way through all the soil and be all the way down to bedrock but 90 percent of the time especially in Colorado we're going to be building on top of soils uh, what do we mean what's the difference between soils and bedrock uh, soils are considered your you know it's more movable uh, it'd be your sand your gravels or silts uh, versus bedrock is like um, it's like a solid base structure that uh, is not going to move over time, not going to settle over time. So of course you get a much better base with bedrock, but uh, there's no reason to dig all the way down to bedrock for, for you know, a medium rise building or anything else. Uh, so let's move on to, if we're going to build on our soil and support our building with this soil, what we need to do is figure out how strong our soil is. So we have to we have to classify this soil to see what kind of properties it might have. And properties include like how much water is in the soil or how permeable the soil is. Uh, how strong is the soil? Is it going to shear off? And um, so this is from the ASTM. Remember that's our testing methods standards uh, 2487 and D2488 in case you are keeping track. Uh, these are sieves and you can see that this is this is the primary way we categorize our soil is that we take these sieves and they stack on top of one another like we see in this machine here and then you dump your soil and they go from the largest sieve to the smallest and you dump your soil in the top one and this whole thing shakes it and moves it and lets the the soil filter down through these different sieves after they're filtered then what you can do is you can empty out each one and you see your percentage. So like so those bigger, you know, bigger rocks come in that the, the wider screen. Anything smaller than that little square in that sieve would pass through and so on and so forth. So second sieve, you dump it out and you have something like that. Third sieve, fourth, I don't know where the last one is. It looks like we're outnumbered a little bit. But, uh, but that gives you the idea of how the sieve analysis works because then we can measure and say, well, this percentage is greater than whatever, you know, the number seven sieve or something, right? All right, so let's take a look at some categoriz categorization we can get after our sieve analysis. What we can determine is if we're going to categorize it as being granular, which is more like boulders and, and, and the larger particles, versus cohesive, which is our very small particles, something like a clay or a silt. And those are our two very broad categories. Uh, generally, it's some mixture in between, like there'll be some 
uh, well, you can see clay sand or sand with some clay or whatever else. But in general, when we start to categorize these things, we would categorize them either granular or uh, cohesive. And you can see this list as you go from the, in essence, the, the particle diameters. And as they get smaller, as we move down, our largest particles we would call gravel, right? So gra gravel uh, technically has a diameter between three and uh, three inches and the number four sieve. So uh, three inches would be as big as we're talking about and then number four sieve is a little smaller. And then we move down. Now as sieve numbers go up, what that means is the, uh, the little grading, the distance that the particles can fit through is smaller. So it's so like a number 200 sieve means that um, it's letting uh, less particles through than like say a number four sieve. So we have um, from moving our way down we have from gravel to sand to silts to clay and you can see we have this line in the middle where we're basically saying everything above that line would be granular everything below is cohesive. So once again we're breaking those two categories those two categories are coming into four categories gravel, sand, silts, and clay and um, another category we need to look at is the plasticity. Plasticity is, in essence, how much it can stretch and deform before it breaks, right? So, uh, so in a general term, when a mixture of soil and water can be rolled into thin threads, uh, so this is one of the, the soil tests is you, you, know, you take your soil and you munch it down and then you rub it between your hands and you see, uh, you know, you're seeing if it can actually roll into a thin uh, thread before falling apart. And from this you can come up with this plasticity index, the PI. Um, and that's basically the, the difference between the, the liquid limit and the plastic limit. And I know these are a lot of words, uh, but basically the way I usually got to know it is, was through the tables and, and categorizing it through tables. Uh, you can actually do some labs uh, to figure out what your liquid limit of a soil is. So before you build your building, you go out and do a soil sample. You bring your sample back to the lab and you can do a series of tests on it. From those tests, you can determine its liquid limit. You can figure out its plastic limit and then you can figure out its plasticity index by just subtracting the two. I think that's probably a better way to describe it, right? So uh, why do we care? Uh, so we, if we have a highly plastic soil, what that means is, is if you think about a real clay-like soil, you've probably heard this before that the, the clay will, in essence, if it's underneath water, in water, under the water table, it'll start to expand. So um, as if you have soil that's expanding, that's going to put extra pressures on your foundation. So you got to be uh, aware of that or you have to deal with it in some way. Uh, so this is saying soil expansion as water table rises, yep, typically in clays. Um, you can get this heaving soil and if you have different, um, different types of soil, maybe one half is heaving more than the other half and that's where you really get some cracking or some structural integrity issues. So uh, when, we, when we talk about classifying our soils, like I said before building, uh, we could look at the, this is the USCS, the, the Unified Soil Classification System, and you can see we have these, these group symbols, GW for well uh, graded gravel, and you can see just like before, we're going from like our bigger particles down to our smaller particles. In fact, there's one main line right here where everything above it is coarse grained, everything below it is fine grained, and with those coarse particles, then we can break it into either gravels or sands. Remember those two we just said? And then we have uh, silts and clays down below. And how do we gonna figure out if it is truly gonna categorize it as a gravel or sand? We start looking at, uh, at our number four sieve. What percentage of particles is actually passing through that sieve? And that'll let us know if we wanna actually call it uh, coarse grained uh, sand or gravel. So, and then that can be further broken down to either clean gravels or gravels with fines or clean sands or sands with fines, right? So now, once again, now we're saying uh, the fines would be, you know, how, how, what percentage of the particles are getting through the smaller sieves. And um, 
and you can you can continue to categorize. I'm not going to require you to use these tables. Uh, when you take the the soils class for the CM students, they'll definitely get more familiar with these. But the idea is that then you can categorize it into, you know, an SC soil, a CL, or OL, MH, you know, whatever it is. And based on that, you can get some some idea of how strong that soil is. This is another table. It's similar to the last one. It should look very similar. It's it's still from the USCS. Um, we still have our coarse and fine, and those are still into their four, and and they're getting more and more finely detailed uh, to identify what group or how you're going to categorize that soil. Uh, this one does show the plasticity chart where you can look at that liquid limit. Remember when we talked about that liquid limit before and plasticity index? So a lot of these, you're, what you're doing is you're mapping out something on a table and, and you might say, well, if I know my liquid limit is like 40 and my plasticity index is 25, then I know that I must be a CL as far as my categorization, right? And I'd say, oh, that's an inorganic clay of low to medium plasticity. So. You know, that's a little bit how those tables work. Um, let's talk about the properties uh, or why we really care. Those are all properties, right? Uh, what makes a soil stable and structurally sound enough to build on? What we really are worried about, a, a couple things we're worried about. One thing we're worried about is this internal friction. Um, the other is cohesion because both of those uh, can affect its ability to resist shearing. So shearing, you know, like scissors are also called shears, is when you have, if you think about two surfaces sliding against one another, that'd be a shear failure. If they, if they can hold each other solid, that's a good rigid structure, right? But once it shears off, you have problems. So, and you can see uh, some, some pictures over here of some failures uh, where things are shearing apart and the whole slope is unstable, right? Uh, so what affects this resistance to shear? We have that internal friction. That's what I say in the ability for it to slide over one another. So if you think of, uh, say your, your soil has a lot of, if there's particles that have ridges and they interlock, then you actually have a high friction uh, between, the, between your soil and it's less likely to shear off. Uh, and then also cohesion is, is a, on the smaller level. It's more like what you're talking about with clays, right? Like if you think about a clay, just trying to rip it in half, it's not so much the, the shape of each individual clay particle as much as it's, I guess technically it's chemical bonding, right? The, the binding force that holds the soil together, maybe not on the chemical level, but definitely molecular level somewhere. So, uh, so that's why we care. Um, bearing capacity of soil. What is wh when we say bearing? What we're saying is like you know, like bearing down is like pushing down on a soil, uh, and we're talking about the ability to resist the load of the building. So that's really what I say in the strength of the soil to be able to hold up uh, the building. And this should make sense. Soil soil test should be done if we have heavy loads or we have a bunch of small buildings together. Um, or a tall building, but not so much uh, single family homes. So if I had a, a building here and say it was a high rise building, so this is what I was looking at with this tall buildings, uh, and we really are caring about the, and maybe it's a light tall building, because we said, well, it's a heavy building, we have to worry about it, well, also a tall building, because if we had a wind load pushing on this tall building, then it would have like an overturning force and you'd have a large force pushing down on this far side meaning it almost acts like we need, we need more bearing pushing up to resist the building pushing down. Because in general, what we're saying is like, uh, if I were to think of all my little soil particles down here, all the force from the building is pushing down right onto that soil. So we need to make sure that that soil can support that, that load down. That's what we mean by the bearing capacity. And if it's a heavy load, or if we had a whole bunch of small buildings together, then that acts as if one, as if it's one big building, right? Because when you think about the the reason that's true is if you think about what's supporting this building, we could think about almost like a soil envelope, like it's going down and around and over there. It's not like directly below the building, right? So if I had another building that was right next to this building, even if they weren't too heavy, then what happens is I end up with this building 
this envelope, this soil envelope overlapping. And so these several buildings together depend on what's adjacent, right? So that's why if we have several buildings together, numerous, numerous smaller buildings grouped together, then we need to worry about bearing capacity as well. However, it's just a single family, smaller home, then typically you can just go based on a rule of thumb soil for that area and, and base your soil capacity based on that. Uh, and this is just an example of supporting a load. If we were supporting say a thousand pounds and we had a foundation, foundation is, is going to transmit the load to the soil below, right? Well, if we have one square foot, so if I were to draw this in 3D, then all of this load is being supported by that one square foot. Uh, versus if we have a thousand pounds and I can have a four square foot foundation, then you can imagine the soil can push up all the way around. You know, I mean, I, I can't really draw 3D very well. But this whole thing, uh, you've probably seen this before, but pressure is equal to force over area. So what it means is if I can increase that area, then I will decrease the overall pressure uh, on the soil, right? So if my, I have a weaker soil, I make a wider foundation, a mat foundation, something that'll dis distribute the load over more area, and that will uh, make my pounds per square foot or pounds per square inch less, and so that the soil doesn't need to be as strong. So that's something to, to, to keep in mind as well. I know there was some example of like, what is it, a, uh, a woman in high heels and the pressure that her, her high heel puts on a surface compared to an elephant and, and the woman puts far more pressure because the area is so much smaller. I don't know, if I knew the numbers, I would do that, but I'm not that good. So let's talk about settlement. Um, what is settlement? Settlement is if you have your building and your building, I'll make this like my ground right here, right? Here's my building, and then underneath the building are all these rocks, and and there's probably a little water in between those rocks. Might be some sand and some gravel and whatever else. Here's all of your soil, right? And um, what happens is if I have this force pushing down from the load of this structure, then you can imagine that the house tries to sink into the soil. So that's really what the settlement is, is like that sinking of the house. Now, how can it actually sink? Um, all of these little area in between rocks, right? I don't know how well I can really show that, but there's little voids in all of this soil. Voids can either be just air, like if you think about, think if, I, if this were a close up and I had a rock here, and a rock here, and a rock here, well, in between here, what I have are void areas, meaning it's just air, like an air pocket. It could be water in there or something. So if you think about a force pushing down on this over time, what can happen is these can shift slightly and this air will eventually get pushed out, meaning the whole thing becomes more compact, right? So, um, so that's more an example of a dense and granular type of uh, settlement. And the big way to limit that is is by compacting the soil. So if you come in beforehand and you just you know you you use one of these big vibrating machines or a roller that's massively heavy to just push down on the soil to get rid of all those voids ahead of time, then you'll you'll have a more stable foundation. You're not worried about the settlement. Uh, clay is a little different. So with clay, uh, like we said, it's not as it's not as permeable, meaning water doesn't push out of it. If you did have some water in here, of course, it would just run out. So it's not really a big deal. But if I have clay, like we said, clay could absorb water. Well, it can also release water if it's under pressure for a long period of time. So if I have my building on top of the soil, pushing against this clay, eventually all this water gets pushed out, meaning there's there's less, there's more, there's less voids, less water. And so your, your whole building ends up settling, right? Which is bad stuff. Um, what happens when things settle? Well, like I said, bad stuff. So you can get some displacement. Um, it can be either lateral displacement, which is horizontal. Uh, like, you know, where you just talked about the, the vertical displacement. Um, so you just have a lot of movement, which isn't, isn't good to design for because our structures can't handle it. Uh, it can happen quickly. This is Highway 36, uh, where if I remember the story right, they found a, a little crack. They're monitoring this crack, but it, was, it only took a week before that crack grew 
to an overall failure. So you can imagine how something starts to settle, it changes, you know, it might put more pressure in a particular location and it's like this cascading effect, right? So uh, moisture on soil, this would be number two. Number one, this, this all goes back, where did, geez, site characteristics. So we just did, uh, that was all just soil uh, type and properties. We also have the moisture conditions and the effects of moisture. Um, well, we care because if we have more moisture, like we said, it can cause a volume change to that soil. If you have more clays in there in particular, it'll start to absorb the, uh, the water and expand. Um, and it can also reduce the bearing capacity of the soil. So basically your soil is less strong if you have uh, more of a if you think about sand and then you had a whole bunch of water in there and the sand would be more likely to want to move away because it's like, I don't know, it's just washed away in essence, right? So how do we, how do we account for these things? Uh, we could use a drainable base layer. So what that means is if I have my structure here, um, I would have one layer with some larger stones or gravel. And what that does is, it, is the water is free to just run out and it will not be trapped within our, our soil. That means that's what it means by drainable base layer. We can also grade to improve the site drainage. So what that means is, uh, and it, you know, most structures should have this anyways, but if we were to put a slight, this is definitely overly exaggerated, but if you were to put a, a grade that's away from your structure, then when it rains or whatever else, it doesn't absorb straight into the structure. It just goes off to the sides. You don't need to worry about it as much. Um, we can also use vegetation. So this is common in, in a lot of drainage ditches. Plant some trees and some shrubs, and what they're doing is they actually suck up the water before it gets into the soil and causes any problems. The third site characteristic that we should think about is thermal conditions or the effects of, of the temperature. And the biggest issue with temperature is this idea of uh, frost heave, which means that you have water in your soil. There's always a little water in your soil anyways. And if that water freezes, as you know, one water is freezes, it expands. So we basically have uh, our voids are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and just pushing the soil up and that's that's what I mean by frosty bore actually horizontally as well it just tries to expand right um, now it only happens so far down because if you go far enough down then the temperature is always the I don't know, what is 60 some degrees right but uh, closer you get to the surface so depending on where you live you'll have to go down below what we call the frost line which is how far it'll freeze uh, below ground and so like say in Colorado, you need to go down like say three feet to stay below those, fr those frost lines so it doesn't freeze for something like a foundation wall. Uh, or if you're gonna run any pipes underground or anything like that, you have to be below that frost line. Uh, yeah, so, so you have to take into account of that, of course, if you're in Texas or Florida, I uh, don't need to worry as much about frost heave at all. The last is geographic factors. And so, you know, what's the, the climate where you're at? We kind of just discussed that a second ago. Are there other climate conditions you need to be worried about? Um, when I was in Norfolk, Virginia, one condition we were really concerned about was the fact that you have uh, water, the water table is constantly changing because of the ocean. So you actually have the ocean coming in. And I lived in an area called Tidewater. So the water was always, you know, basically the tide would come in and the groundwater would go up when the tide came in and that affects things like foundations um, so we had an open no one has a basement right you can't have a basement because of uh, the water table so high and it would constantly fluctuate because of that climate uh, flat or sloped construction site yeah well we talked a little bit about how that would affect things for drainage and whatnot uh, resource availability and you know what it, what is it like where you're at as far as uh, labor versus material if you're at a place where labor is abundant and cheap, then that's a different factor when it comes to your construction versus if materials are cheap, right? So I think I brought this up in the intro uh, day when I was talking about my background in, in, uh, in concrete uh, form work. And we said, well, we had handset forms, which took a ton of labor. So we moved away from handset and went to crane set because while the equipment was much more expensive, the labor was it didn't require as much labor and labor isn't cheap so so that's the end of this section uh, this is part one of two look forward to the next one coming up soon talk to you later thanks